Father, you know that I'm nothing more than a billion needs for you. So this is what I ask you. That you'd wear me like a glove and speak to your people with love. Turn their eyes above in your precious name. Amen. I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes about loving Jesus. But I got to start with something that happened to me when I was here. Sometimes when I come to preach in a region, God will do something to me that has to do with the people that I'm going to speak to. In this experience, I was quiet, just holding my heart upon the Lord. My favorite thing to do on the earth is to recognize his presence, not try to enter his presence, not try to call his presence down, but just recognize he is present and just linger there aware of him. And as I was doing this, just enjoying the sweetness of his presence, simply like this, I was taken into the woods and I saw something moving very quickly in the woods and I'm looking at it go through the woods and as soon as I lock eyes on it and I realize it's Jesus, he stops when I recognize him and he turns his whole body towards me, everything facing me with all of his person and he smiles <laughs> from ear to ear so happy to see me recognizing him <laughs> he was wearing he was wearing dark green and brown uh, ephod type thing uh, he was a, like a priest garment in a sense but it was very humble he was a little dis uh, unkept but he was so happy to see me and somebody came up to me, I didn't put it together, somebody came up to me yesterday and said, you know, you're in Woodland. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I didn't even recognize that. But when she, when she said that to me, I thought, wow. And she says, you should, you should look into this a little bit more. It may be more than what you're thinking. And so I did. I, I just turned my heart towards the Lord. And I feel like what this woman was encouraging me to and what Jesus was showing me is that what he wants to do in Woodland is to make a little bit of rustling to turn to see if they'll turn their attention to him. And then he and they will face one another and there will be a revelation of Jesus and his delight in them. So all of this to say this is loving Jesus. When you love Jesus, you love to look at him. There is nobody who loves their wife and doesn't like to look at her. <laughs> love has this attraction to it. And when Jesus turns and gives all of his attention to you and you've given your attention to him. It just shows you that you have all of his attention when he is given attention. So I want you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 145, 20. And while you're turning there, I'm going to tell you one more story. Do you guys like stories? I like stories. They, they really kind of emphasize a point. Um, one of my heroes in the faith came to me in a dream one time. And he asked me, do you, want, do you want to know the secret? And with me, I know this guy walks with God. And I'm like, yes, I want to know the secret. So he grabs me and he takes me into this closet apart from everybody and he shuts the door. <laughs> and when he does shut the door, I'm looking at him. And I'm, I'm leaning in to hear the secret. And he closes his eyes. He does just like this. I'm going to do exactly what he did. He went like this. Jesus, I love you. 
Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. I really do. He completely forgot about me. He completely forgot about himself. And when I woke up from the dream, I realized he never told me the secret. <laughs> but I realized he exemplified the secret. The secret wasn't found in words. The secret was found in forgetting everybody else, even himself, and loving Jesus. This is the key. What has God wanted from the very beginning, if not our hearts? The very first commandment, he's, he says, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your strength. He wants every bit of you to love him. That's his desire. I remember Jeffrey texted me one day and he said, if you love, if he says, if we love him, we'll keep his commandments, but his first commandment is to love him. So basically he's saying, if you love me, you'll love me. <laughs> and I said, bro, that's amazing. <laughs> but that's the key. It's this love relationship with him is the root and spring of all things. So I'm going to talk to you about quickly about loving Jesus and then how to love Jesus, or what it is that causes love for Jesus. So look at Psalm 105, verse 20. Look at this here. The Lord keeps all who love him. Say this with me. The Lord keeps all who love him. Say it again. The Lord keeps all who love him. A couple of things we need to recognize here. It doesn't say the Lord keeps some that love him. It says every single one that loves him, the Lord keeps. And it's also important to recognize that it says the Lord does the keeping. The Lord will keep everybody who simply turns their affection towards him, sees him in the woods, gives him attention, and shares a love glance with him. I'm telling you right now, you don't even have to worry about keeping yourself if you'll just love him. Because if you love him, he'll do the keeping. And I think it's so important because sometimes we get so busy keeping ourselves, we forget to love him. We get so busy keeping ourselves, we forget to give him ourselves. The Lord will keep you. That's my number one first point here. The Lord will keep you. You don't have to worry about not doing this again. Or do, how many, look at the checklist. Have I done this? Have I done that? Have I done enough? Am I enough? Listen, throw out all the lists and turn your heart towards him. And this in and of itself is enough because the Lord will keep all who love him. Turn over to uh, Romans 8. So point number one was what? The Lord will keep you, right? Look at Romans 8, 28. Paul says, we know <laughs> that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Are you following what he's saying? This changes or should change our whole perspective of life. It should change the way you see your job. It should sh change the way you see people. It should change everything about your paradigm in life. You say, how? Well, if you believe and you know, as Paul says we do, that if you love him, he turns everything to work in your favor, then even the stuff that doesn't look like it's your favor because of love is for your favor. If you say, Eric, I just don't know if that's, if you can say that, because I've had some people, you know, do some bad things to me. I tell you this, if you keep your love set upon him, what happens is even the bad stuff you find out was the best stuff for you. How many can say in this room that 2020 was amazing for you? Okay. Because in one sense, the loving of the Lord causes the Lord to keep you and to supernaturally and sovereignly turn everything to face your good. Do you remember when Jacob and Leban have this deal and Jacob has favor because he loves the Lord? He has favor on his life and Leban wants to 
twist things. And he goes, you know what? I'm going to give you something. But I'm going to keep the good sheep. You can have all the bad ones. So the bad ones that come out that are spotted, those are yours, bro. I'm going to keep the good ones. <laughs> so God causes all the sheep to come out spotted. <laughs> so everything goes to Jacob. So he's like, you know what? Forget this. I'm taking all the spotted sheep. You're going to take the good sheep. So God switches everything around to have everything be good sheep so that Jacob gets everything. In other words, there's somebody sovereignly working underneath the ground on your behalf when you simply love him. Does it make sense? Do you know how it's going to work out? No, but you have faith in the one that you love. It should change everything. Your boss is mean to you. Well, he's working in my favor. He works for me. <laughs> Eric, I don't understand. How, do, how does he work for me? Well, his harsh treatment of you, the Lord turns all things to work together for the good of those that love him. You keep your heart set on loving the Lord and all things serve the purpose of God for your life. This is incredible, isn't it? You can, we can trust God to be sovereign enough to make sure that every raindrop hits its appointed target. And that all things are his servants. If you look back throughout your life, hindsight's 2020, is it not? You begin to see how God's hand was in his fingers were in everything. You're like, what in the world? Some of you in this room can tell me stories of how God was working things in your favor before you were even saved. How many of you can say, God was grooming me for everything he had for me before I even looked at him? <laughs> If a, if a husband and wife prepare a baby's room and paint it and get all the stuff in there before the baby's even born, how much more does God create everything in your favor before you're born again? In other words, he can be trusted. All you have to do is give him your heart. We're going to talk about how to do that, but let's look at another scripture that's really special. Turn to John 14. <clears throat> is this okay? I just, I just want to nail down what it means or what happens when we love the Lord. So number one is the Lord keeps all who love him. Number two, he works everything in their favor. Okay, look at John 14, verse 22. Um, the Lord, you know, let's look at verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. Are you seeing this? You have the promise of Jesus unveiling his person to you if you will just love him. Here's the reason why some people have no revelation of Jesus. They won't give him their affection. But if you turn your heart towards him, you see him rustling around in the woods, you recognize it's him, you give him your attention, he turns to you, you have a look of love, and you have a revelation of Jesus. It's the revelation of Jesus by love and love that causes a revelation of Jesus. How many of you want to know Jesus? Well, I just showed you from the scriptures how you can grow in loving Jesus. It's seeing him again and again. Well, how do I see him again and again? Set your affection again and again and again upon him. You say, Eric, I don't know if I can set my affection. Well, Colossians 3, 1 differs with you, just so you know. The scripture actually says, set your affection on things above. Set your affection on things above, not on the things that are below. So let's look at another one. Let's turn over to... Song of Solomon 8.6. Let's look at how, how powerful love is. Song of Solomon 8.6 says this. Put me like a seal over your heart. That's, that's love. Let, like a seal on your arm. Look at this. Love is as strong as death. Are you seeing this? So the reason why Jesus wants you to love him is because he doesn't want to lose you. 
See, if you know anything about your resolve, your resolve only dissolves. Do you notice that? Did you hear what I just said? Your resolve always dissolves. You know you're growing in dependency when you realize that even your decision isn't strong enough. You need Jesus. Love, heart affection, is as strong as death. He wants a bond unbreakable. I believe Jesus' connection with his Father while he was on the earth was love connection. They loved one another. Jesus refused to act without him. He refused to act without him. It was a love-centered, love obsession between the Son and the Father. The Father loves the Son. It's this love union that takes place in, in, a, in an affectionate exchange. It's as strong as death. Look at another one here. Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 16.22. This is pretty strong, but it's important to see that all this plays together. 1 Corinthians 16, 22. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all in Jesus Christ. There is, look at verse 22. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Do you see this? Why is he talking so strongly? He's trying to show you that there is ulterior motives that can slip in. And if love is not the root, then you're on the wrong track. If love is not the anchor of your relationship with God, then you've got some manipulation going on. There's something else that you want. And so he's saying that lifestyle of wanting the things of God without giving God your heart is manipulation. It's witchcraft. Let's turn over to 1 John 4.19. We're going to switch now into how to love God. So did I convince you that loving God is important? <laughs> Not that you didn't know that. Loving God will keep you, Right? Point number two, does anybody know? Point number two, point number one was keep. Number two, he'll turn everything for your favor. Number three, what was it? Love is as strong as death, right? Is that what it was? Or no, he will disclose himself to you. And further on, he says he will make his home on the inside of you. You want to know the presence of the Lord? It's linked with love. I want to dwell, I want to be a dwelling place for God. God only dwells where he's loved. You become a habitation to the degree that he has your affection. It's very important. Now look at verse 19 of 1 John chapter 4. 1 John 4, 19. Look at this. It's amazing. We love because he first loved us. And many of you have read this many times. It's important to realize that there is no loving Jesus without a revelation of Jesus' love for you. All your love for Jesus comes from how clearly you can see he loved you. It is only in seeing how much God loves you that you are able to return that love to God. Andrew Murray said, the love with which I love God and my brother is the love with which God has loved me. In other words, the more that you receive God's love, the more you're able to love God. It's so important to realize this. You say, Eric, but all right, I do, I understand that, that God loves me. Well, I encourage you to look deeper into his love because it will quicken more love in your heart for him. And you'll find more and more of his reality of, of love working in your heart. Look at John 15, verse 13. Is, is reading the Bible okay with you guys? In some places they don't even want to open the Bible. but Not you guys. John 15, verse 13 says this. Greater love has no one than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. So if we love God... By seeing God has loved us, 
we see the greatest demonstration of love was him laying himself down for us. So you're saying, Eric, what are you pointing us to? I'm encouraging you to remember the gospel. And as you remember the gospel, it will keep love alive in your heart. There's actually a, a portion in Song of Solomon where the bride, that's us, falls asleep and becomes negligent towards the Lord. He comes looking for her. He speaks out, but she's sleeping. So he comes and he knocks. She doesn't respond to his voice. So he knocks. She doesn't respond to the knocking. So you know what he does to try to get her attention? He reaches, the bridegroom, reaches his hand through the door. He reaches his hand through the latch. He's trying to show her something. Christ, our bridegroom, has nail-pierced hands. He's trying to say, remember my works in your life. Remember what I did for you. Remember my display of love by my nail-pierced hands and the works of my God on your behalf. And you know what happens when she sees his hand? The scripture says her feelings were aroused for him. A lot of us become numb because we've moved past the gospel. A numbness starts to set in because we've become more prophetic. Do you know what I mean? We want the more cool things. And we forget that the most beautiful thing and the most powerful thing is the most simple thing. God has died for men. See, if we want to move past the gospel... We slip into the problem in every letter that Paul addresses. If you look at every letter that Paul writes, his solution for all of them is remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. And it is as you remember the gospel that you fall in love with Jesus. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. Actually, let's look at chapter 3. So it says here, Two, yeah, you're right. You were right. Two. So it says, To the angel in the church of Ephesus, write, To the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, he says this, I know your deeds. This means he knows your life. And your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men, and that you put those to test who call themselves apostles and are not, you found them to be false. You have persevered, and you have endured for my name's sake and not grown weary. Isn't that a great church? They're, they're toiling. Toil means perseverance in the midst of pain. There's resistance, and they won't stop. They're like Marines who take the beachhead. That's what these guys are like. And their doctrine is clean, too, because they're able to tell who's false and who's not. They don't even tolerate an evil man in their midst. So they stay away from sin. Their doctrine is, is clean, and they persevere. We think these guys are nailing it, right? Look at what Jesus says to them, to these guys. He says, I have this against you. You've left your first love, which shows me something, that just staying away from sin doesn't mean you love Jesus, Persevering in the midst of pain doesn't mean you love Jesus. Your doctrine being clean doesn't mean you love Jesus. Because Jesus says, you've left your first love. You kept all these things going, but you left me. Look at what he says here. He says, you've left your first love. Therefore, look at the word he uses here. Remember. Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming, and I will remove the lampstand out of its place and yes, unless you repent. Do you see how important this is? It's not just like loving Jesus is, you know, 90% of the Christian life, and there's 10% other things. Or, you know, like, if you love Jesus, you know, just make sure you're loving him while you're doing all the stuff. Jesus is saying, if you don't love me first, everything's worthless. G. Campbell Morgan said, God only accepts service that issues out of first love. He also said, no amount of activity in the king's service will make up for the neglect of the king. In other words, Jesus is saying, if I don't have your heart, I never got what I wanted. If I don't have your heart, what did I die for? Your works? No. No. What did I die for so you would know what's right and what's wrong? What did, I, what did I die for so you would just stay away from sinning? 
I died so that I could have your heart. And as St. Augustine says, Christ has stolen my heart and ran away to heaven with it. That's, that's the essence of this Christian life is a love relationship. So let's look at Romans 5 and then we'll be done. If that uh, amazing piano player could come up, that'd be great. Romans 5. I'm going to read this to you. And I'm asking you to hear this and put your faith in the words I'm saying. In other words, by faith, suck every nectar out of the words that I'm saying. Because in it is the juice of love. In it is the medicine for your heart. In it is the remedy for lack of love for Jesus. And a numb heart. Maybe, maybe you used to be in worship and they would say something like, like, you're worthy of it all. And your heart would just go up and be like, yeah, you are. And now you're just looking at your watch and yawning and you're just kind of like, what's the next one going to be? Do you know what I mean? This is easy. We, we can slip into this numbness so easy, especially because of monotony. Just consistently doing that. Maybe you, you used to come in and to your prayer closet and you'd sit down and you, you'd just start crying. And you'd just look up and you'd say little things like this, like a little child, Father, I love you so much. Maybe you don't even remember the last time you wept because of love. Maybe, maybe the liquid love hasn't come out of your eyes in a long time. Maybe your heart is not so tender as it used to be. I'm going to read you something, and if you, by faith, will suck every nectar out of it, you'll be filled with love for Jesus. Do you want to hear it? For while we were still helpless, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for... A good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us much more than having now been justified by his blood. We shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. <laughs> and not only this, but we also exalt in God through Christ Jesus, through him whom we have now received the reconciliation. Therefore, as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by transgression of the one many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Remember the gospel that Jesus, who dwelled in light unapproachable, left heaven to become an infant for you. And then not only was he an infant, but he grew in grace and truth. God Almighty in a human body. God, God Almighty in the restrictions and frailties of a human body for you. They question him. They don't believe him when he speaks. He spoke the world into existence, but he may not be telling the truth. It doesn't make any sense. They just can't see him. But there was a woman who saw him. And she recognized him. 
Everybody else is looking at him. Could he be the son of God? Could he not? As soon as she sees him, she throws herself at his feet. And she stopped and staring and fixed upon him. This is Mary of Bethany. <laughs> Taken with him. She's saying, they may not recognize you, but I do. So I bring all this to, to remind you that his love is unmatched. Maybe somebody else has your affection right now, your attention right now. I want to ask you, did they bleed for you? Maybe something else, uh, some other thing has more of your heart's affection and desire than Jesus Christ. I want to, I want to ask you, did, did it resurrect from the dead for you? It did not. There is no man, there is no woman on the planet that comes close to the love that Jesus Christ has for you. If everybody could stand to their feet, I love that. And I want you just to put your hand on your heart and I want you to pray with me and I'm gonna hand it over to, to Aaron. But I want you to pray this with me. Say, Jesus, I ask you that you would open my eyes to see your love and to believe the cross and send the spirit into my heart and shed abroad the love of God. I ask you to help me to live remembering the gospel that I might live with my love being quickened again and again. In your precious name, in Jesus' name. Hey Amen. Can we just worship just for a second? Just begin to just open your mouth. We're done, but I'm just going to spend this last little bit. It just, oh, how I love you. Oh, how I need you. Pray. Yeah, just, so, just lift your hands, your heart. Oh, how I need you. Oh. Oh, how I love you. Oh, how I need you. 